Hello everyone, welcome to learn wireless technology. In this tutorial, we will discuss about Mac layer functions. Mac layer or medium access layer as you know, is a layer 2 protocol that offers data transfer services to the higher layers. It also provides radio resource allocation for transferring data from higher layers. Mac layer also receives services from lower layer, which is the physical layer. The services it receives from physical layer are data transfer, signaling of HARC feedback, signaling of scheduling requests, measurements, and CQI reporting. The physical layer provides physical resources for transmission of all these data over the air. Let's have a look at the list of some main functions performed by the Mac layer. Mac layer is responsible for mapping between logical and transport channels, multiplexing and demultiplexing of MAC SDUs, error correction through HARC, priority handling between UVs by means of dynamic scheduling, transport channel selection, scheduling resources for uplink and downlink data transfer, supporting random access procedure, maintaining uplink timing alignment, discontinuous reception or DRX so the PDCCH is not monitored continuously. Let's discuss more about some of the important MAC functions. Mapping between logical and transport channels. The MAC layer maps the logical channels carrying RLC PDUs to the transport channels. So at the transmitter end, which can be either E node B or UV, multiple RLC PDUs, which are called as MAC SDUs from logical channels, are multiplexed and mapped to something called transport blocks to be sent over transport channels for transmission over the air. At the receiver end, the transport blocks from transport channels are demultiplexed and assigned to corresponding logical channels, which are then transferred to higher layers. Now, multiplexing at MAC layer enables the data from multiple logical channels to be transmitted in a single MAC PDU, which can be transmitted on the DLSCH, that is downlink shared channel, and ULSCH, that is uplink shared channel, which are transport channels. Priority of logical channels is also considered during multiplexing. We will talk about MAC PDU in more detail in coming slides. Scheduling. Scheduling is nothing but the assignment of uplink and downlink resources for data transfer. The MAC layer performs all scheduling related functions in the uplink and downlink. The MAC layer selects the transport format associated with all transport channels. Transport format is the format defined for the delivery of transport blocks on transport channels. MAC also includes HARC functionality and selects the associated HARC format. Since all the scheduling is done at the E node B, so for uplink resource assignment, the MAC layer at the UE is responsible for reporting scheduling related information such as UE buffer occupancy and power headroom. MAC layer handles the priority between multiple UEs. It also handles the prioritization of the different logical channels for one UE. The next major function performed by MAC layer is random access procedure or RAJ procedure during initial network access. MAC is responsible for random access procedure in the uplink that can be either a contention based or a non contention based process. RAJ procedure is used when UE wants to move from RRC idle to RRC connected state when connection re-establishment is required if the radio link failure happens. It is also used during handover when UE moves from one cell or E node B to another cell or E node B. MAC layer also supports in maintenance of uplink timing. Now the UE needs to maintain timing synchronization with the cell at all times. The MAC layer performs required procedures for periodic synchronization. The timing advanced instructions are periodically signaled by the E node B to UE by means of MAC PDU signaling. Now let's have a look at the structure of MAC PDU and how the data is packed into the PDU by MAC layer. MAC PDU is also called as transport block, which is carried by the transport channels. So this is how a MAC PDU can be represented. This portion is called the MAC payload and the overall structure is the MAC PDU. As you can see, a MAC PDU corresponds to a transport block which consists of a header, control elements, 
Mac SDUs and padding. At Mac layer, multiplexing takes place which allows Mac SDUs from multiple logical channels and the Mac control commands to be transmitted using a single Mac PDU or a transport block. So the Mac layer is responsible for the mapping of multiple logical channels to transport channels during transmissions. And during reception, it is responsible for demultiplexing and mapping of transport channel data to logical channels. The header describes the format of the PDU itself. It consists of number of subheaders. There's one subheader for each MAC control element and each MAC SDU in the PDU. Additionally, there can be a subheader to specify padding as well. So the header is composed of multiple subheaders, one for each component part of the MAC PDU, that is control elements, SDUs and padding. The control elements enable the control information such as buffer status or power headroom reports to be piggybacked with the data payloads that are to be transmitted on DLSCH and ULSCH transport channels. For the control elements, the subheader identifies the specific control element being sent. The MAC SDUs are the logical channel SDUs which corresponds to RLC PDUs. For the MAC SDUs, the subheader specifies the logical channel number and the size of the SDU being sent. The padding included is optional and it occurs at the end of the PDU. If the padding is only 1 or 2 bytes, then a fixed size padding subheader of 1 or 2 bytes can be included before the subheader corresponding to first MAC SDU. MAC can also operate in transparent mode where no header is prepended to the PDU. So the overall picture shows that all subheaders are grouped at the start of the MAC PDU in the MAC header. These are followed by control elements, which are then followed by the MAC SDUs. Any padding to be added is included at the end of PDU. The MAC control elements and MAC SDUs are placed in the same order as the corresponding MAC subheaders. Now let's take a look at the structure of MAC subheader. As you know that a header consists of multiple subheader and there's one subheader for each component part of the MAC PDU that is control elements, SDUs and padding. So this is the general structure of a MAC subheader. The length of each subheader can be 1, 2 or 3 bytes. Please note that this header is from the initial release of LTE that is release 8 and release 9. In later release of LTE that is after release 13, there's a slight change in this structure. One of the R field is assigned to another field called F2. Rest of the fields are same in release 13 subheader structure. Here R stands for reserved. Its size is one bit and it is set to zero, which means it does not have any meaning or does not occupy any information for time being. E means extension, which is of one bit size. It is a flag that indicates whether there are more fields present in the subheader or not. When this field is set to 1, it indicates that there is at least one more RRELCID field that follows the current E field. And if it is set to 0, then it indicates there are no more RRELCID fields and the next byte is the start of MAC SDU or padding. LCID is the logical channel identity field. This field identifies the logical channel instance of the corresponding MAC SDU or the type of corresponding MAC control element or padding. LCID holds a 5-bit value and the value depends on the MAC control channel element. This is the list that shows the LCID values of the corresponding MAC control element in downlink. This table shows the values of LCID for downlink shared channel. The control elements sent on this channel are UV contention resolution identity, timing advance command, and DRX command. And this table shows the values of LCID for uplink shared channel. The control elements sent on this channel are power headroom report, CRNTI, and three types of BSR. This list is from initial LT release. The list gets longer for the later LT releases. F stands for format, which defines the size of the following length field. If the F field is set to 0, the size of the length field is 7-bit, 
and if f field is set to 1 the size of the length field is 15 bit and l is the length field which indicates the length of the corresponding sdu now the f2 field that we mentioned earlier which is the new field that replaces one r field in release 13 it is a format field that indicates the size of the length field if the f2 field is set to 0 then the size of the length field is determined by f field and if f2 is set to 1 then the size of the length field is 16 bit so this was all about the structure of mac pdu and header of mac pdu now let's talk about the mac control elements that we have been mentioning many times Basically, MAC control elements are control commands and reports that enable MAC operation. These control and reporting information can be piggybacked on data payloads of DLSCH and ULSCH transport channels. As per initial LT release, there are six control elements defined in MAC specifications, out of which three control elements are sent on DLSCH, that is from E node B to UE, and three are sent on ULSCH that is from UV to E node B. Let's look at the control elements sent on DLSCH. Timing alignment. This is a timing advance command sent to provide uplink timing synchronization to the UE. It has a size of six bits. Timing advance is periodically signaled by E node B to UE by means of MAC control element. The initial timing advance is sent to UE in the random access response message and the subsequent timing advance is signaled within MAC control element. We saw the MAC header structure, right? So the LCID field will have the value 11101 which indicates the MAC PDU transmitted by E node B has a timing advance command. The E node B configures the UE with a timing alignment timer and UE might lose the synchronization if the timer expires. DRX command. This is used to initiate discontinuous reception mode at the UE. The size of a DRX command is 8 bits. DRX is a mode where the UE remains in sleep state for a configured period of time and there is no interaction with the network over the air interface. UE monitors the PDCCH for the time when it is awake, that is during on duration time and turns off its receiver during the periods of inactivity. UE Contention Resolution Identity This is used during random access procedure to resolve possible contention between multiple UVs trying to simultaneously access the network. UVs send their identities to the network on common control channel during RAS procedure and if the MAC control element in the contention resolution message contain the UE identity that matches with the one sent on common control channel, then that particular UV wins the contention resolution. The size of the UV contention resolution identity is 48 bits. Now let's look at the control elements sent on uplink shared channel. UE buffer status report. It is used to report UE buffer occupancy to help the E node B to enable uplink scheduling for UE. Basically, buffer status report provides the E node B with information about the amount of data in the uplink buffers of the UV so that E node B can adjust the uplink grants. Buffer status report can be classified in terms of BSR timing and data structure. In terms of timing, BSR are classified as regular BSR, padding BSR, and periodic BSR. Regular BSR is triggered when a new high priority data arrives at uplink buffer. Padding BSR is triggered when the number of padding bits in a data message is larger than the size of BSR. And periodic BSR is triggered according to predefined periodicity. In terms of data structure, BSR are of two types, short or truncated BSR and long BSR. With short or truncated BSR, UV reports buffer status for only one LCG, that is logical channel group. And with long BSR, UV reports buffer status for all the logical channel groups. There are maximum four BSR groups. The size of the buffer status report is six bits. UV power headroom. 
It is used to report UV transmit power compared to the maximum power or if the UV is currently power limited. Basically, the power headroom report provides the serving E node B with information about the difference between the nominal UV maximum transmit power and the estimated power for uplink shared channel transmission. Simply speaking, power headroom indicates how much transmission power is left for UV to use apart from the power being used for current transmission. The size of the power headroom report is 8 bits. The power headroom control element value ranges from minus 23 dB to 40 dB, where the negative power value indicates that the UV is power limited, which means it is already transmitting with maximum power and cannot perform further transmissions. Whereas the positive power indicates that the UV still have some power left to perform new transmissions. Power headroom is reported periodically or based on path loss threshold. The path loss is calculated based on the measured reference signal power and if this value changes over a certain threshold, then UV reports the power headroom. CRNTI It is used as an identification for a UV when sending information over common control channel. CRNTI is assigned to UV by the network during RATS procedure. It is a temporary identity which is made permanent upon contention resolution. The size of CRNTI is 16 bits. CRNTI is sent as a MAC control element by the UV and the network addresses the UV using this CRNTI for providing uplink grant or for transferring downlink data. So this was all about the MAC layer functions, the PDU structure and details about the MAC control elements. Thanks for watching.